I want you to remember life is given only once. It is our life and you cannot put on hold whatever you want to do. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast, friends. This is Kim Skorupski, and I'm super excited to introduce to you my friend and colleague and former supervisor at Rush University Medical Center, Dr. Susan Chubinskaya. Hi, Susan. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kim. I'm so excited to be invited again because it is so much has happened since our last interview, which was, I believe, about three years ago. And I'm dying and anxious to share with you what we have done since that time. That's right, everybody. You will want to go to facultyfactory.org after you listen to this wonderful podcast and check out episode number 11. That's when Susan's first episode dropped back in um, 2019. So Susan, will you please talk um, first, tell everybody what is your title at Rush University Medical Center? Thank you, Kim. So I am Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs and I, of Russian University. I am also Klaus Kutner, Professor of Osteoarthritis Research. I still continue uh, doing my research in the field of post-traumatic osteoarthritis and osteoarthritis. In addition to being Vice Provost and doing non-paid job as a researcher, I am doing a lot of work in my professional arena, not only in faculty affairs, but in research arena. Uh, I was the president of the Orthopedic Research Society from February 2020 to February 2021. I'm still the member of the board of directors, and I'm involved with two other international organizations as International Cartilage Repair Society and Osteoarthritis Research Society International. Holy moly. Okay, so this, this, everybody, this is what you're going to see. You're you're in for a lot. Susan is a bundle of energy and does nothing but work and create wonderful programs. And back, if you listen to back at number episode number 11, you will learn a lot about how Susan set up the office in a faculty affairs. It's a very uh, diverse group, of, including multicultural issues, global affairs community. And so you'll learn how that was a couple of years ago. And the word on the street is that her program has grown like gangbusters. So Dr. Chubinsky is going to give us two messages today. She's going to give us an up- update on how her office has grown and expanded and some really new innovative things she has implemented. And She's going to give a message about um, some pearls of wisdom, some things that she's observed for faculty members um, as we're trying to build our careers through the academic uh, ladder. So take it away, Susan. Thank you, Kim. So as many of you, um, we were developing multiple programs for faculty, and I realized that they could become much stronger and we can expand these programs if we partner with two additional offices. Uh, So two offices that I eventually reorganized into the Center for Innovative and Lifelong Learning as part of faculty development, faculty affairs, where Office of Continuing Medical Education, as each of your institution has, and another office which was kind of at the beginning of its development, Office for Continuum Professional Studies. So I was able to convince my leaders, my provost and my president, to integrate these offices with faculty affairs. And that means that my office from the person of one, when I started in August 2010, has expanded to 19 uh, as it is now. So basically my office now has four arms. It has faculty affairs itself, which as many of you do, uh, is provide oversight and faculty recruitment, promotions, engagement, any data, we build faculty management system. I think I talked about it when we discussed it three years ago, all the um, reports, anything what falls under faculty affairs. Then we have an office of mentoring programs, which has four mentoring programs. 
research education mentoring program for postdocs and mentoring program for women. We have Office of Global Health, which is kind of an artificially attached to the faculty affairs, but there's a lot of academics going on, and we have symposiums, we have professional development opportunities for students, residents, fellows, and faculty, and a lot of different education academic programs which are falling under global health. And we have Center for Innovative and Lifelong Learning. So basically, the focus of the center is threefold. It is it builds programs and provides accreditation to specialty specific or profession specific programs like continuum medical education, continuum nursing education, continuum education in for physician assistants and all kinds of specialty specific programs. Just to give you some idea, over the last year, that part of the office built more than 5,000 programs. Then Center for Continuum Education, for Center for uh, Innovative and, and Lifelong Learning has a second part, which is professional development. And that's where a lot of partnership occurs between Office of Mentoring Programs and the center, because, for example, early career development for faculty, mid-career faculty development, teaching excellence boot camp, leadership development programs are built together with the, by these two offices. And then leadership development part. So there's basically three arms of the Center for Innovative and Lifelong Learning, which perfectly complement of the initial idea of faculty affairs office. Actually, COVID helped with these collaborations, and they began when Rosalind Franklin was lucky enough to recruit a new dean of the School of Medicine, Archana Chatterjee, who is a great mentor and friend of mine. And when she moved to Chicago, we got together and we discussed how two schools can collaborate. By that time, we already developed early career and mid-career programs for faculty. But the idea was to combine our efforts and expand it because since my dean of my Center for Innovative and Lifelong Learning, we became revenue-generated unit. And so one of the tasks that I'm responsible for, my, my office of this part of the office is supposed to generate revenue. So the way you generate revenue, you don't use only internal resources or internal loaners, but you try to expand it to regional, national, and international arena. And that's what we are doing. So we got together with Newton. We set up standing meetings on a biweekly basis, and we discuss how these programs can be transformed into partnership across multiple institutions. I'll give you some numbers. Before COVID, when these programs were offered in person, we limited to 40 members for your participants to provide this inter opportunity to build networking and interaction and in-person conversations. But with COVID, we were able to bring more than 200 learners to both early career and mid-career. Mm -hmm. And the way we did it, we looked at the curriculum and we discussed what part of the curriculum could be organized and facilitated by Rosalind Franklin Fox, what part of the curriculum could be done by us. And we had it as synchronous live events, but when there were conversations which were specific for faculty for one school, we would break into break, in, break rooms and we would provide some specific information. For example, promotion. Each institution has specific requirements, right? Though it's pretty much similar, but each institution has some additional specifics. So when we talked about promotion, we gave general picture which is relevant to faculty from both institutions, but then we put them into breakout rooms and we had two people facilitating um, covering the specifics of each school. We had a module on finances for mid-career faculty and we brought basic science chair and we brought clinical chair. Rosalind Franklin doesn't have clinicians who are permanent faculty members of their school. They're all adjunct. Mm -hmm. However, for them, it was interesting to learn on the financial models used at Rush. So it's still an opportunity to learn regardless what structure your institution has and what part of the structure you represent. So that became quite successful. And so we tried it last year. We are submitting it as an abstract for the GFA conference, hopefully this summer. And we are now a second round, which will be, these courses will be offered in February and March. And 
our next step is to offer it at the national level because programs have been tested first at one institution, then at two or three institutions. So we believe that after this year, we can offer it and expand it to the national arena. That's right. Why not? That's that's just so fantastic. I love it. I love this just smart, selfless investment of programs. And it just speaks a lot to this community that how we all recognize we're, we're, we're helping each other out. There's nothing to be gained by um, keeping things to ourselves and um, being selfish with with ideas. Let's let's share, you know, let's share these um, things. So yeah, that's that's another great again a good example of a testament to how our faculty affairs and faculty development community is all about sharing resources and and sharing, sharing and learning from each other and then produce scholarly work because our ultimate goal as leaders that present it get feedback, uh, collect the outcomes, and then publish. And uh, I think when it is collaborative effort, it helps you to calibrate your program. It helps you to understand that it's not only focused on internal issues, but it addresses common issues or common topics which are important to faculty, regardless which institution they come from or which part of the country they come from. And that's how the scholarship and common knowledge can be created. So we're extremely excited about it. And we have many ideas what else can be done between the two institutions or more than uh, two institutions. And actually, I'm going to make a plea that any if any of our listeners are interested in partnering with us as contributors, as facilitators, or as opening these opportunities to their faculty, I am extremely excited to share this opportunity with you. Please email me directly and we can really expand our collaboration. Great. Um, I'll, I'll make sure let's, we, give, we give people your email address before we um, sign off here. But just if you are listening and you are curious, she's got a long name. Like Susan is a long name like I do, but it's Susanna underscore underline Chubinskaya at rush.edu. I'll spell that for you. Susanna, S-U-S-A-N-N-A underline Chubinskaya, C-H-U-B-I-N-S-K-A-Y-A at rush.edu. It'll be on the website. But um, go ahead, Susan. I want to hear more about you went from, you know, the end of one back you back in August 2010 to 19. You kind of described these four programs. Can you give us a sense of the level and types of, of um, jobs these other 18 people are doing? Sure. Absolutely. I'll be happy to. So I have five directors under me. I have director of my office of mentoring program, director of my entire office, who is in charge of faculty affairs piece. I have director of global health, and I have two directors of the Center for Innovative and Lifelong Learning. Under the center, I also have a number of managers, I I think at least four or five. I have two instructional designers, and we are hiring now um, project coordinator, basically someone who can help us to build uh, these programs, especially if it is in person, if we need to uh, rent facilities and deal with um, food and travel and some other things. So that is under this, and we have e-learning coordinators, we have people who are dealing with website content of these courses and people who are providing certificates for continuum education, whether it's medical education or any professional education. So this is on the Center for Innovative and Lifelong Learning. On the Global Health, I have director, I have one full-time assistant, and my executive assistant, she kind of splits the time between me and Global Health. And she is not as my as executive admin, she is more as a manager who, and she has a master of education. So she contributes to our teaching excellence bootcamp and she does a lot with the global health arena. I also have under the mentoring programs, director and admin, and under faculty affairs, I have database designer or database specialist who deals with our faculty management system that they spent a lot of time talking about last time. And I have two, one is credential and administrator and one position is vacant that we are hiring 
to as an admin of credentialing coordinator. So basically to cover the entire spectrum of faculty life. By the way, we just published a piece in Academic Impressions, kind of an, it was specifically for women, but it is similar for men, faculty life cycle from the postdoc to the most senior position mm -hmm. and what we have, what we don't have, and what we are building to really address the needs of faculty, regardless what their age is, what their career stage is, to really help them at every single step of their academic life. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. Love it. Yeah, I'm reflecting back on the notes from the faculty management system that you described. That's always a very common inquiry in our GFA group on faculty affairs community, what kind of data and system do you have? And so if you're curious about systems, go back and listen to episode number 11. But Susan described this customized through an outside vendor faculty management system that they built for about $30,000 a year. And we just published it. We published it in faculty development in September, not the system per se, but the concept, how to combine faculty promotion with faculty annual performance, how to align these two processes and the vision for the system. And actually, um, to my delight, there are many more institutions who are adopting or building the same system as we did. For example, uh, Kaiser Permanente in California, a new school in Michigan State. I had been in conversations with a Drexel is looking into the system. So there's a number of institutions which became interested in the system after I presented it at GFA and AMC conferences four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we are helping our colleagues to build these systems at their institution. And so the publication came out in September in Faculty Development Journal. Fantastic. You'll find this scholarship on the facultyfactory.org website. Every time we have faculty affairs and faculty development scholarship that is published, we scour the environment and you will find it there on the website. I may add one more thing Please. since we're talking about scholarship. Yesterday, we received an amazing news for us because it took us quite a lot of efforts to get this paper accepted. But yesterday a paper which summarizes six years of outcomes and now con fellowship that I was talking about at the last podcast as well. I was talking about the small pilot programs that were given to uh, early career faculty and outcomes because some of those who received the scholarship as postdocs or instructors became now associate professors and, and became highly recognized or nationally, internationally recognized researchers. So the outcome of the programs are going to be uh, in academic medicine. And yesterday we received the information that this paper is accepted. So mm -hmm. we are very, very excited. Basically, this year we have three huge scholarly products, which two are published and one is coming out on faculty management system, on this concept of continuous faculty development, and our con fellowship. So we are extremely oh. happy and very, very proud of it. Setting a great, great example. High bar, folks. We got to get publishing our stuff. <laughs> this is There's no point in keeping it to ourselves. We have to get it out there in the public arena. Great job. Susan, before I let you go, I, I we definitely want to get some words of um, encouragement, inspiration. What are you seeing? What are you observing? You've been in academic medicine in your entire career you are a faculty person. You've built a, in a successful basic science lab and research career agenda, and now you're at a provost level. What are you observing, especially like after COVID, and what are you seeing our faculty's needs, um, interests, motivations, anything that you're seeing that you can speak to or advice to faculty members themselves as their like, early career, their mid-career you know, what's kind of like popping into your head and into your heart that you're noticing and that you could say to the faculty members? Actually, it sounds maybe strange, but COVID opened new opportunities for faculty. Because you don't have to travel, you can take courses while you're at home in your pajamas, or if it is asynchronous, you can do it at your leisure or whenever time is allowing you. We have much higher participation of faculty in multiple programs. So my advice to faculty, find, identify what is important to you at this particular stage of your life and your career. Identify what 
suits your schedule, what suits your family situation, and embark on this learning opportunity. Because there's so many resources are available, not only this RAS. RAS it is enormous resources. If you go to our faculty affairs webpage or Center for Innovative and Lifelong Learning, you will find thousands of courses. You will find leadership micro learnings. You will find enormous amount of content that you can utilize at your convenience. So start building your career as soon as the first day you're on campuses, as soon as you're hired, start thinking what should be next and build it up. Start from small. Don't try to choose the entire piece. Identify, be strategic in your career. I always tell this to my faculty. Identify what you can afford financially from the time, from the family, what you can do today and start building it by sm using small bricks, which eventually will bring you to the desired outcome or desired promotion. If you are hired as a new faculty right after residency, fellowship, or postdoc, learn rules for promotion. You don't want to lose your time and wait for five, seven, ten years, whatever each institution has, and then arrive to the time and not being ready. Learn the rules. Try to strategize what you're going to accomplish in the first six months, in the first year, and then go from there. Have frequent conversations with your supervisors, your chairs. Make sure that they're aware of your successes. Don't be shy to share your successes. And really take your career in your own hands. At the same time, identify faculty affairs leaders at your institution because people like Kim, like I, like our colleagues who we've known for the last decade, if not more, their job is now to make you successful. I constantly repeat that your success is my success. I kind of accomplished, I don't want to say everything what I could have, but quite a bit. But so now my success is measured by, by how many promotions we have, how easy faculty got to be promoted, what it took for them, whether we provided opportunities for them to learn and develop. And so that's why and learning who, who your leaders are, what they can offer, what institutions can offer, what the institutional resources available to you and start utilizing them. A lot of these resources are free and you can learn so much and uh, brush up your skills, get new competencies, not only related to your profession, whether it is medical, research, education, but to your faculty being. And so that is my advice, regardless of which career stage you are. Mm -hmm. I and I love it. And, and remember what Susan just said, don't bite off the whole thing. So I think a lot of times we have almost decision fatigue because there is almost so much to choose from. We are very it's a blessing and a curse, a blessing that there are thousands of things. And so you, your head might want to spin around and think like, I have to do everything. No, you know, you can just do one thing this day, this week, this month, this quarter, this year. So calming down and not necessarily thinking that you have to do everything. But I like how you said thinking in terms of what is the budget of time, resources, what stage are you in your career, not only, but your faculty. I mean, I mean, your family, your family, what, what, are, what are the competing demands at home? So there, I, I think that's a really good point. There are lots of resources. We are here to help you. We're all here to help each other and calm, you know, calm ourselves down. Don't be so anxious that you have to hurry up and do anything or hurry up and do a lot. Sometimes just very strategically, one step at a time and not being afraid to ask people like us who who love to see you succeed. Yeah. And I have a, another advice for both leaders and faculty. Whatever you do, approach it from the research perspective. A scholarship, it's not that many people who find opportunities or see opportunities to do scholarship work in administrative job. Being a researcher, I approach everything what we do from the research perspective. We collect uh, pre-assessment, pre-assessment, pre-program assessment, right? We collect uh, post-program assessment. We do post-program assessment. We collect data during the program. Uh, you can do qualitative research. You can do longitudinal research when you look at your program over the years and what lessons you learn. All of that is could be published. 
all of it can constitute scholarly work. But if you don't think of it ahead of time, if you didn't collect data before you begin, and if you don't think what is the objective of the program, what you can try to accomplish, and how to measure your successes, you won't be able to do it. But if you think about these things in advance, you will have plenty of opportunity and plenty of data to publish. And there are tons of journals. Some are more difficult to get through. Some are less difficult to get through. But as long when you summarize what you've done, it helps you with two things. Once it's kind of looking back and see what you accomplished and evaluate what you've done. But it also helps you to think what's next and what you could have done and how you can could have done it differently. And that will help you to build new programs or identify new partnerships and elevate your programs to the next level, which you haven't thought about when you started doing these programs. Love it. Fantastic. Friends, this is the Vice Provost of Faculty Affairs at Rush University Medical Center, Dr. Susan Chubinskaya. Susan, it's been wonderful talking with you. It's just always amazing that you have boundless energy and ideas and no one can convince people to do things like you. So if you also want a coach who can help you figure out how to make a convincing argument, Dr. Chubinskaya is your coach. So Susan, thanks again. I'll, I'll give you the parting thought. Thank you, Kim. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. It's my honor to be interviewed today, and I'm so excited that I was given this chance and choice. But I also would like to wish all of you a very happy and healthy new year. I hope you, your families, your loved one, uh, well, uh, they continue with their life regardless the challenges that all of us experience. I want you to remember life is given only once. It is our life and you cannot put on hold whatever you want to do. Just do it with all the precautions, with everything understanding what's what COVID offered to us, but don't stop living. It is only once. Life is given once and it is your life and make the best out of it. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.